Let's go one layer further. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about mental health, right? So this is this is a field of medicine today that I would also argue is grossly underserved, right? So yeah. everything you've said to date resonates. Uh, I, I completely agree from my own experience that the resources in pediatrics and primary care, I mean, uh, these things are, are are unfortunate at the moment. Harvard has I think sixty percent of the of the, of the uh, undergraduates are getting some sort of mental health support, and it's completely outdoing all the resources available to the university health services. And so we have to outsource some of our mental health. And this is a very richly endowed university. In general, we don't have the resources. Yeah. So 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 here we live in a world where there's. I think the evidence is very clear that when when a person is depressed, when a person is anxious, when a person has any sort of mental or emotional illness, pharmacotherapy ph pharmacotherapy plays a role, but it can't displace psychotherapy. So you That's you right. have to be able to put these two things together. And the data would suggest that the knowledge of your psychotherapist is important, but it's less important than the rapport you can generate with that individual. Now, based on that, do you believe that the most sacred, protected, if you want to use that term, profession when, within all of medicine will then be psychiatry? I'd like to think that. Um, and I think, but here's, here's some, uh, I'd like to think that. And I'm not going to ever, well, I shouldn't say that. If I had a psychiat psychiatric uh, GPT speaking to me, I wouldn't think that it understood me. On the other hand, um, back in the 1960s or 70s, uh, there was a program called ELISA, and it was a simple uh, pattern matching program. It would just emulate, emulate what's called the Rogerian therapist, um, where I really hate my mother. Why do you say you hate your mother? Oh, it's because uh, I don't like the way she fed me. What is it about the way she fed you? And it's just very, very simple pattern matching. And this ELISA program, which was developed by Joe Weizenbaum at MIT, A, his own secretary would lock herself in, in her office to have sessions with this thing because it's non-judgmental. And I'm sorry, this was in the 80s? 70s or 60s. Wow. Yeah. And and it turns out there's a, that there's a large group of, of patients who actually would rather have a non-human, non-judgmental person who remembers what hmm. they said last time, shows empathy verbally. Hmm. And, you know, again, I wrote this book with Peter Lee, and Peter Lee made a big deal in the book about how GPT-4 was showing empathy. And in the book, I argued with him that this is not that big a deal. And I, I said, I remember from medical school being told that some of the most popular doctors are popular because they're very deep empaths, not necessarily the best doctors. Right. House is your great example in TV that, exactly. you know, yeah. And so I said, you know, for certain things I might actually want, but that's just me. And I think that for, um, I could imagine a lot of, for example, what cognitive behavioral therapy being done and be found acceptable by a subset of human beings. Hmm. Yeah, you might be right. It's just, it's not, wouldn't be for me because I'd say I'm just speaking to some stupid program. But if it's giving ins you insight into yourself and it, it's based on the wisdom called for millions of uh, patients, who's to say that it's worse? And it's certainly not judgmental. And maybe it'll be less. Uh -huh.